Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. Um, but we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com and hit the contact us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. The Apostle John writes in chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And chapter 5, verse 13 is the hook we've been using to hang all of John's thoughts on. And in this letter, the Apostle John teaches that certainty is possible in the Christian life. Our English word for assurance can mean certainty of mind. Assurance starts with the mind. You must know and believe the right realities to have assurance. You can know and believe the wrong realities, and you will never have assurance. And throughout the past few weeks, I've mentioned that there are two sides to assurance, objective and subjective. And objective assurance is grounded is the ground, excuse me, for a subjective assurance. Subjective assurance derives the oxygen it needs to live and thrive from objective assurance. So assurance starts with the mind, but it does not end there. The reality is that John proclaims, namely that Jesus is the Son of God, who gives eternal life to everyone who believes in him, will make an impact in your life. The doctrinal test which we looked at two weeks ago, leads into the moral test. What you believe will affect how you live. Will. It's a certainty. And the end of chapter 2 through the end of chapter 3 has a familial feel to it. At the beginning of chapter 3, we find one of the greatest declarations that we have in all of Scripture that we are children of God. The Apostle John writes, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So those who believe in Jesus are not just called children of God, they are children of God. This truth must be precious to John. It's among the first truths that we read in his gospel. John 1, 12 through 13, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And at the end of this familial section here in 1 John, he writes, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So eternal life, that's a family benefit. If you are in God's family, you have it. And if you aren't in God's family, you don't have it. But along with the family benefit, there are also family characteristics. Namely two that we'll look at in the coming weeks. This morning, holiness. And then two weeks. Love, holiness and love. And we find the big picture for this passage in verse 10. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. The word evident means well-known, clear, visible. So John is saying what I'm writing about is not something that's hidden or secret. As the false teachers claimed, this kind of secret knowledge, you had to be enlightened to get in on it. But rather, this truth was clear. It was obvious. It wasn't hidden under a bushel. No, religion. That's not what was happening. 
The Christian Standard Bible translates evident as becomes obvious. John is saying, hey, guys, it is very obvious who are the children of God and who aren't. We don't have to complicate this. There are only two spiritual families, the family of God or the family of the devil. Those are your options. It's not a take it or leave it option. If you are in one, you aren't in the other. And each family has its own characteristics. And the character trait, traits you exhibit show which family you resemble. So membership in the family is obvious by the family characteristics you show. And we all know what this looks like. For example, in the Wilson family, we have something that has been coined the Wilson dead eyes. You may see it this morning. And if it is, you do, I was born this way. And to my knowledge, all of the cousins have it. And they have showed it very early in life. Very early. Remember when Carson was born, it's like, man, you're looking into a mirror. But you see the Wilson dead eyes and you go, yep, yeah, that's a Wilson kiddo, right? It's a family resemblance. And that's the point that John is making here. The predominant characteristics of our lives give evidence about which family we belong to. And the first of these family characteristics is holiness. And John's argument in 3, 4 through 10 can be summarized in three statements. First, God's children are honest about the nature of sin. God's children are honest about the nature of sin. And this section, I've not talked about this yet, but this section uh, shows us, gives us a little hint about John's uh, writing style. He seems to write in concentric circles. You guys know what that is, right? You start with a small circle, then you get a bigger circle, then another one, another one, another one, and so forth. So it's, it's getting bigger the farther out you get from the center. That's what John does. He'll make a statement, and then he'll make a similar statement later in the book that enlarges on what he said earlier. So in this passage, he does that. So instead of going through the passage starting in verse 4 and arriving at verse 10, we're going to kind of jump around the passage as it were, because I think that's going to be most helpful to see the argument that John is making. So how are God's children honest about the nature of sin? Well, first, they call sin what it is in its essence. Sin is lawlessness. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And this is not merely breaking God's law, although it includes that. This is the desire that says, I will do things my own way, no matter what God or anyone else thinks about it. John Stott explained it this way, sin in its very nature is lawlessness. Lawlessness is the essence, not the result of sin. Sin is Lawlessness. So this means God's children call sin, sin. If God says it's a sin, we agree with him and we say it's a sin. We don't put cute words on it. Sin is not a mistake. It is not a slip up. It is lawlessness. Sin is rebellion against God. It is hatred of God. And sin hates the fact that God exists and that he has the right to tell his creatures what to do. And it is this lawless nature of sin that causes us to say, you know what, I think the sky is purple. When God says, no, the sky is blue. Or more seriously, it is sin that makes us say that something is right when God says it is wrong, or to say that something is wrong when God says it is right. So God's children know and admit that sin is lawlessness. That's what we see in verse 4. But second, they also admit and acknowledge that sin has satanic origins. Look at verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Sin is a family trait of the devil because he has been sinning from the beginning. And the devil can't help himself. He sins and he sins and he sins. He's been sinning from the beginning and will continue to sin for all eternity. And this false teaching that John condemns throughout the book had a defective view of sin. J.C. Ryle, commenting on the history of false teaching within the church, said, All heresies that have afflicted the Christian church have their origin in a defective understanding of sin. 
where you spot false teaching, you will find a defective view of sin. So God's children do not have a defective understanding of sin, but rather a biblical understanding of sin. And that is to say we have God's understanding of sin because God has revealed his understanding of sin to us. But not only are God's children honest about sin, they also know the purpose of Jesus' work. And John makes two statements concerning the work of Christ, which are connected by the word appeared. First, in verse 5, we read, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So Jesus appeared to take away sin. The reason for Jesus coming in the incarnation was to redeem sinners by taking away their sin. Boyce wrote, it is a characteristic of Christ to take away sin. We see this from the Gospels. Before Jesus was born, the angel told Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will what? Save his people from their sins. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Apostle Paul declares the same idea as the Apostle John when he wrote, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, how do we become the righteousness of God? Because Jesus took our sin. Jesus is the sin bearer. He came to take his disciples' sins upon himself and to grant them his righteousness. But how does Jesus, how can, rather, Jesus take away sin? What qualifies Jesus to take away sin? Well, it's in verse 5. In him, there is no sin. There's no sin in Jesus. This is similar language to what we read earlier in 1 John, 1 John 1, 5. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There is no sin in Christ. Just as verse 4 is a statement about the essential nature of sin, Verse 5 is a statement about the essential nature of Christ. There is no sin in him. This is who Christ is. It is who Christ is. It is who Christ was. And it is who Christ always will be. And as the sinless son of God, he is uniquely qualified to take away our sin. We've heard a lot lately about how the person of Christ and the work of Christ go together. And this is a classic example here. Jesus takes away sin. He can take away sin because there is no sin in him. The sinless son of God takes away our sin. But not only did he appear to take away sin, we see in verse 8 that he appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Look at the last sentence in that verse. The reason, don't you love it when authors are just very clear? The reason, oh, thanks, John, appreciate it. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The word destroyed can also be translated as loosed. Jesus, in his death, loosed the grip that the devil and his work had on us. Now, this isn't loosed in the sense of loosened. It's not that Je- it's not the picture isn't that the devil had us in his grasp and it just got a little looser. No, the picture is. The devil had us in his grasp, and Jesus loosed it to the point where we're no longer in the devil's grasp. That's why you see it translated as destroyed. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. Satan's grip has been destroyed. So these first two realities provide the foundation for the first family characteristic, which is holiness. Or, as John describes it here, not practicing sin. So God's children do not practice sin. Ian Hamilton is helpful here when he used two words to explain John's argument. He used the words unthinkable and inconceivable. It is unthinkable that God's children will practice sin. Well, why is it unthinkable? Let's look at verse 6. John gives two unequivocal statements here in verse 6 of why it's unthinkable that God's children will practice sin. The first one is, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. So to say that you abide in Jesus who takes away sin and in whom there is no sin and still live a life characterized by sin and unholiness is unthinkable. Right? You can't claim to be close to Jesus and live antithetical to who Jesus is. It's unthinkable. 
It doesn't make sense. The second, second statement is, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Seen him or known him, I believe John is just saying, uh, conveying the idea there of believing in him. To continue to live in what Jesus died for is evidence that you have not believed in him. You do not know him. It's unthinkable that you would live this way. Ian Hamilton is helpful here. To live after you profess, profess faith in Christ, as you did before you profess faith in Christ, is to show that you never truly believed in God's Son. So John's point is clear. It's unthinkable that God's child will remain in sin, that they will practice sin. And the false teachers were trying to deceive these believers into thinking you could have Jesus, the sinless one, and the sin which you love and crave. In other words, you can believe in Jesus without radical life transformation. In other words, you can have your cake and eat it too. And John doesn't want these beloved children to be deceived. Look at verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So as one commentator said, the false teachers were seeking to lead them astray, not only theologically, but morally as well. So don't be deceived. Remember, Jesus said, you will know them by their what? Fruit. But John doesn't leave the argument there. Not only is it unthinkable that God's child would practice sin, that they would be characterized by sin, it is also inconceivable. It can't even be imagined. If John were British and that thought would have come into his mind, he would have said, that's just rubbish. Why is it inconceivable that God's child would practice sin? Well, because, verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. The key phrase in the verse bookends the verse, born of God. This is what we call regeneration. The child of God has been born of God, and therefore they are a new creation and incapable of incapable of living a life that is characterized and dominated by sin. And John furthers the argument by saying God's seed abides in them, the very life of God, as it were. That's what John is saying. The very life of God dwells within you through his spirit. And you probably notice as we read the text that John repeatedly uses the word practice or in another form, keeps. It's in chapter 4 or verse 4. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 10. So we need to be careful here. John is not saying that if you sin once, when you profess to be a child of God, that if you sin once, you are automatically a child of the devil. That's not what he's saying. He is saying that if your new life as a Christian is just like your old life before you were a Christian, then you aren't a Christian. Plain and simple. Why? You don't bear the family resemblance of being in God's family. In God's family, we don't practice sin. We don't. We don't live lives that are characterized and dominated by sin. There has been a radical change in the life of God's child. If you are God's child, listen, this is reality. This isn't just philosophizing or theologizing, if that's even a word. These are realities. If you are God's child, you have a new heart with new desires, with a new motive for living. You now have a desire to practice righteousness and holiness and not sin. I don't have the exact quote with me, but one commentator said that sin is an unwelcome guest in the house of a Christian. We don't practice it. We don't associate with it. And Jesus, the Son of God, told his disciples once, that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So as Jesus, the Son of God, did the will of God, likewise, those who are adopted children of God will do the will of God. Those who have been born will, will, will obey the will of God. Count on it. Take it to the bank. 
will be the only ones who get this. As the White Talks now just said, you can put it on the board. Yes. He was much louder. I don't have it in me. So through these three statements, John helps us understand this first characteristic of God's children, holiness. God's children are honest about the nature of sin. God's children know the purpose of Jesus' work. Believers have been born of God. Therefore, God's children do not practice sin. But our work isn't done. We still need to answer the question, how does this relate to assurance that I have eternal life? Remember, we are on now the subjective side of assurance. We've looked at objective and one, one through four and through the doctrinal test. Now we're shifting our attention. Not, we're not leaving behind what we've already learned. We're bringing that with us to see how it informs the subjective. The subjective in this case is... Do you practice sin or do you practice holiness? That's what we're looking at. To do that, let me address three different consciences. I tried hard to alliterate, but it didn't happen. Confused is the first one. Seared is the second one. Insensitive is the third one. And each of these consciences rob us of assurance in some form or fashion. Now, it is possible that you are here this morning and you don't fall in either three of those. That doesn't mean you're off the hook. This text should be used by all God's children to examine their lives. It would be very easy to take this text and give yourself a check mark without any further examination. So we need to examine our lives. And as you examine your life, remember that holiness, not practicing sin, is in the minutia of life. The details that you might think trivial. Alistair Begg calls this vigilance in the routine things of life. So here's what I'm thinking of. How do you respond to your child who interrupts you when you're reading a book? It's not personal or anything. How do you respond when you are in a traffic jam and you're crunched for time? What happens when you don't get your way? Husbands, how do you act when your wife asks you to do something? Do you do it as she asks, or do you take matter into your own hands because you are the leader of the home? If your wife asks you to put something by the sink, do you put it by the dishwasher out of spite because you know better? Wife, how do you respond to your husband when he does that? That's the minutia. That's where we live. That's the routine of life. How do you respond when the dishwasher doesn't fit as it should after you got a new one and the installer didn't get it the right the first time? That is a personal thing. It's these small areas. If, if you can get this in your head and your heart, it is these small areas that prepare us for faithfulness in the big areas. The routine, mundane, day-to-day active activities is where it is proved whether you practice sin or do not practice sin. And that's hard. Because we want to run to the big things. Well, I've not murdered anybody. You know, I've not taken a gun and like killed anybody. What well, doesn't matter? How do you treat your wife? How do you treat your children? That's where it is proved whether or not you are a child of God. And this is where the confused conscience comes into play. This conscience may be confused by John's clarity here. You know, sometimes it is, you can get confused by clarity. You can. It's not because of the text you're reading, it's because of you. I say that with love. But many Christians desire to apply scripture to their mundane lives, but when the heat comes, they really struggle. And this can lead to a confused conscience. And what should you do in times like this? Well, if you find yourself in this category, and I know some of you are because we've talked about it before, let me offer two categories of counsel. First, you've got to prepare If you know there are routine routine things in your day-to-day life that trip you up and tempt you, prepare for them. Take time to pray 
and search the scriptures to see how you can be obedient, to see how you can practice righteousness in that moment. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Guess what? He will. When you do that, when you pray, when you search scriptures with a desire to be obedient, he will help you. You need to create a scriptural rescue plan. Many of us want to apply scripture and pursue holiness in these moments, but we don't because we aren't sure what to do in the heat of the moment, so we revert to the flesh and sin. So let me offer a familiar scenario from my own life. Most of you know, I love to read. The problem is I live with many people who like to war against my love to read. So here's a very common scenario, even though Victoria disagrees with me. This happens more than she thinks it does. I get ready to sit down and read in my favorite chair with an ice cold Diet Coke. I sit down, crack open the Diet Coke, open my book, put on my reading glasses, because I'm an old man now, and then I hear, Dad! Theo ate my snack. Theo's our dog, for anybody that doesn't know that. So there's a decision right here that I've got to make. I could act selfishly and just sit in the chair and ignore what's going on. Just read my book. Me and Joel Beak. Just sit and read. I could act selfishly and get up out of the chair and kick the dog and then yell at the child for interrupting my precious reading time. You should have been more careful with your snack. You know that dog does that. Those are options. Or, since I know this is a common occurrence, I can prepare so that when it happens, I am prepared with the help of the Holy Spirit to walk in holiness. I can be prepared to not let this mundane aspect of life be an opportunity to slip into practicing sin. If I am prepared, I can implement my rescue plan. I can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help, and then I can obey Scripture. I think we we miss this sometimes. Obedience requires preparation. It does. So prepare for the small areas of life, and you will be prepared for the big areas of life. So the first category of counsel is you need to prepare. The second category of counsel is you need to act. I've also encountered Christians who have a confused conscience that they know what to do in the moment, but they are paralyzed by the moment. Perhaps it's a Roman 7 experience but I won't follow that rabbit trail this morning. When the heat comes, they know what they want to do because they have new desires, but perhaps they get caught up in existential questions such as, when do I change? How do I change? And oftentimes I've sat down with people and they will say, I pray and ask God to change me, but then nothing ever happens. To which I usually ask, what did you do after you prayed? And the response is often nothing. They did not act. You must act. Many assume that heart change happens during prayer. Now, don't get me wrong. Prayer is essential for changing your heart. But if we don't act, I think we're on good a a good foundation to say change will not come. We have to remember that change happens in the action, not before the action. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works within you. We work, God works, sanctification. As you stop kicking the dog and replace that with petting the dog, over time you change from a dog hater to a dog lover. Or when you stop yelling at your kids and start talking to them in love and grace as an image bearer, over time, your angry heart is changing. I think, you know, I love the book of Exodus. We're reading it right now for family devotions. 
You know, God would have never parted the Red Sea, I think, if Moses hadn't have done what God asked him to do. Well, how do you see that Moses trusted God in that moment? He, he did what God told him to do, right? And many of us, I'm afraid, are frustrated and we're like, God is not helping me when all the while we're sitting on the couch, sitting on our hands. We're not acting. Our acting is an evidence that we trust God's promise that he will work when we do what he says. Is it easy? No, it's not. That's why God tells us over and over, I will help you. I will help you. I will help you. I promise. I will help you. But you, there, you often don't experience the help until you move. And we have to remember that as God's children, we act from the great realities of, of the faith, not for them. So you pursue holiness, you act, you prepare, because Jesus appeared to take away sin and destroy the works of the devil. You pursue holiness and do not practice sin because you have been born of God, and he has given you brand new desires that will lead to new actions. So if you have a confused conscience, it can cause you to doubt assurance. And my counsel to you in light of this text is prepare for holiness and then pursue holiness. You've got to actually do something. Many of us are may not agree with the let go, let God theology, but many of us in practice are let go, let God kind of people. I'll just sit here. God will do something. He won't. It's practicing holiness brings assurance. The second conscience is the seared conscience. And Paul wrote to Timothy about false teachers and described them as liars whose consciences are seared. And the word Paul uses for seared means seared to the point of insensibility. This type of person has sinned so much they no longer feel the pain of sin anymore in their conscience. Philip Ryken in his commentary on 1 Timothy wrote, the more a soul sins, the less painful sin seems until finally the conscience becomes dead to all feeling. And I think this type of person is very quick to relish the great realities of our salvation, such as union with Christ, but they're very slow to uphold Christ's commands that we walk in holiness that we say no to sin, that we say yes to holiness. The person with a seared conscience says they want Jesus, but they refuse to let Jesus touch anything in their lives, especially their idols. When confronted with the commands of Scripture, they use theology as a deflection. Well, brother, we're grace. We're under grace. We're not under law, which is true. But we still have to obey. Or you bring a clear command of Scripture, and they'll say something like, well, the Holy Spirit has revealed that differently to me. No, he hasn't. You're a fool. You have a seared conscience. And it doesn't take big, monumental sins to get to this point. Now, as a clarification here, the person with the seared conscience lives in unrepentant sin. That's what it means to practice sin is that you don't repent of it. What sin did Paul focus on there in 1 Timothy? Lying. Lying. It wasn't embezzlement. It wasn't murder. It was lying. Small lie after small lie sears the conscience. Husband, those consistent angry words with your wife are deadening your conscience. It's not embezzlement or adultery that deadens your conscience. Those sins are often the sign that your conscience is already seared. Those with a seared conscience practice sin. Now, if you fall into this category, I do have bad news for you. You can't have assurance of eternal life because I don't believe, according to Scripture, you have eternal life. So the Bible's solution for you is to repent 
believe in Christ and cry out to him to save you. And guess what? Jesus says, I will. But you are in danger. Grave danger. You are not in God's family. According to the Apostle John here, you are a child of the devil. You have not had the new birth. You are dead in your trespasses and sins and are awaiting the judgment of a holy God. So forsake this way of living. Repent. Believe. And cry out to Christ to save you. Well, the third conscience is the, I'm calling it an overly, overly sensitive conscience. This conscience is sensitive, but I don't think it's sensitive in the way that the Bible instructs us to be. Some people might even call it an overactive conscience. This is the conscience that may sin once and repent, but they still automatically assume that they are not a Christian. Now, will a Christian be broken over their sin? Yes. But they will use that sin to run to Christ, not away from him. This conscience may read this text and is automatically in the realm of despair without examining their own lives. Or really without examining the larger teaching of John, 1 John 1, eight. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There, there is a reality as much as we hate it as God's children that we do sin. We hate it. We repent of it. We turn from it. So here is what John says to you if you have this overly sensitive conscience. The overall trajectory of your life is what matters. If you are characterized by holiness, you are a child of God. So John says, take heart. You have been born of God and you have eternal life. Now, it's also possible that an overly sensitive conscience could also be confused, which means they need some help determining the overall trajectory of their lives. And if you find yourself in this category, I have great news for you. God has given you a wonderful gift, the church. Ask someone. Get involved in discipleship. Be open, honest, and vulnerable with your discipleship partner about where you are. And when we're open and honest and we're vulnerable, we'll learn over time that our discipleship partner, our brothers and sisters, can often know us better than we know ourselves. So if this is your conscience, John's word to you is comfort. Be assured. Know that you have eternal life. The children of God, Jesus, came and took away your sin and destroyed the works of the devil on your behalf. You have been born of God. Therefore, do not practice sin because God's seed abides in you. Thank you.